Good afternoon all and thank you for joining us. Uh, today is the fourth in our series of uh, webinars for you, especially within the tourism sector. It's done in partnership with Visit Scotland and Digital Boost. So myself, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, I'm the Industry Development Manager and my colleague Andrew Craig are hosting this deeper dive into the experience sector, particularly having a, a really um, deep look at uh, online booking, especially for for your particular sector, something that many of you clearly with the numbers that are on this um, see that as as an important thing to have, something that you're looking at currently, either from the perspective of just starting to examine getting a system within your business or looking at the current system that you have and seeing if you can upgrade it or add additional functionality for it. So today. We've reached across the, the, the world to, to some, um, some of the four uh, great uh, solutions that are out there for you. Uh, and we've, brought, uh, we've asked the representatives of those uh, businesses to come along and, and have a conversation and explain some of the, the, um, the benefits, the functionalities, uh, the little things that you might be uh, worrying about or those things that you hadn't realized uh, these, by taking uh, a, an online booking solution on board, you might solve other problems as well. So the four, four uh, businesses we've brought on is firstly is Bakun. Uh, we've uh, business development manager Sydney Strout will, will will speak as well. Checkfront director of sales Alex Mari. Um, Alex, we've actually got out of bed. He's, he's uh, over in uh, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, from DigiTickets, their business development manager, David Edwards. And from Fair Harbor, uh, we have enterprise account executive, Tyler Stindle. Or Tyler Sindle, my apologies. May I, before I hand over to them, uh, to do a quick introduction of their business and themselves, just say to you that we're really, really keen to get as many questions asked uh, across to us as we speak today. So you will see that in your control panel, uh, just click on questions, fire your question in, and we'll attempt to answer those th within the session, or definitely uh, we'll, we've got a Q&A session at the end of this presentation where we'll hopefully uh, get through as many of your questions as possible. The last thing I would say to you is that we will be recording this. We'll not mention you by name if you do ask questions, um, it will, you will be anonymous if that's something that you, you, you care about. But we will also be uh, uploading this to visitscotland.org so that um, you might want to have a look at it again if there's some details that if you've been scribbling madly, you might possibly have missed. So um, to start us, um, could I hand over to Sydney? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Patrick. So my name's Sydney Strout. For those who don't know me, know me, I head the business development sector for Boken. As most of you know, Boken is a global reservation system that was acquired by the TripAdvisor family in early 2018. Boken and TripAdvisor commit to offer the best solution for our tour operators, such as yourself, in every aspect of the business. And in turn, we lead to a much better traveler experience. Uh, we offer continuous improvements with our connectivity. We're always adding new distribution channels, especially in the new online markets. Our system is built to ha help all your tour and activity providers worldwide and sell more places while taking these bookings on way more easily. Um, to touch upon our pricing model quick, so recently I'm sure you guys know that we switched to a subscription plan where we allow you guys to either go for a free version or a pro plan. And this opens up the opportunity to add some of the top features that we have accommodated for many of the business needs. So these include the inventory service plugin, agent sales portal, ready-made website integrations, widgets, sub accounts, our large B2B marketplace and more. So currently, you know, we're working with more than 150 countries from small independent operators to large like global activity companies. Uh, we have hundreds of people in the UK, um, whether that's resellers or suppliers, and a lot of those come from the Scottish region, and we're always looking to build the portfolio in as many destinations as we can. So I do look forward to having this discussion today and talking about reservation systems and the opportunities in the B2B world. Thanks, Sydney. Now, if we could hear from Alex from Checkfront. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so my name is Alex. I'm the director of sales at uh, Checkfront. We're a booking management platform for tours, activities, rentals, and accommodation. 
Uh, we've been on the market for around uh, 10 years and uh, so far we have grown our product significantly and our community to over uh, 5,000 uh, operators in 94 countries. Our goal is to empower operators to, to grow, grow their business and we do that by uh, product development, constant product development and support to our, to our operators, especially in, in the last two years since uh, the pandemic started to, um, uh, to um, hit. Um, and uh, we have uh, a very um, um, a world-class support team that's working around the clock to um, <clears throat> empower our, our operators. Um, and to support the diversity of their business. Thanks, Alex. And over to you, David. Yes, thank you. Um, David Edwards from Digi Tickets. Um, Digi Tickets have been around now just over a decade, based down in Exeter in the UK. Uh, we service um, well over 450 attractions throughout the UK and Ireland and into Europe as well. Um, those vary from the likes of castle estates, uh, museums, farm attractions, escape rooms, really varied uh, client base. Um, we offer everything from online ticketing, uh, designing a ticket site for attractions. Um, that feeds into a back office system CRM uh, that manages that inventory and also feeds out into an EPOS uh, TIL solution as well. Um, so an all-in-one environment. Um, there's various additional offerings on top of that. So payment processing online, uh, staff management uh, scheduling as well. Um, and links to various channel managers. So we're able to spread that inventory across different marketplaces as well uh, for attractions. Um, we, we focus heavily on development. Uh, the product's always improved um, as part of the ongoing packages for clients. Um, that's free of charge. Um, our pricing model really varies between initial setup uh, for the service and then it's really pay as you go depending on how much that system is used, whether it's per transaction, per ticket sale, um, a few different options for clients um, going forward. Thank you very much. Over to you, Taylor. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Tyler Snow, and I work on our enterprise team at Fair Harbor. Uh, joining you all today from Amsterdam, home office. Uh, what brought me to Fair Harbor initially was my passion for the industry as a skier, as a windsurfer, and generally someone who just likes to be outdoors. I think that's something you'll find with the, the team here at Fair Harbor. Uh, Fair Harbor is a reservation software for tours, activities, and attractions. We work with operators all, of all shapes and sizes, ranging from mom and pop businesses to enterprises such as the United Nations. Um, in terms of how our pricing works and kind of our, our partnership model, we've always been a transactional style of business with our ultimate goal of helping you convert more direct bookings. Uh, in 2013, we were founded in Hawaii as a family business. Two brothers started the company working for a catamaran charter drew a lot of inspiration for how we developed the product. In 2018, we were acquired by Booking Holdings and started our international expansion. Since then, our team's grown to over 550 travel experts, whose main goal is helping over 14,000 partners of ours grow their business, save on costs, and streamline their operations. Uh, thanks again, Andrew, and excited to be here with you today. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tyler. So to kick things off today, uh, we thought that the ideal starting point would be around the theme of why businesses need a, an online booking system. So Sydney, I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on, on why should a, uh, a tourism business invest in an online booking system? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that a booking system kind of takes away the heavy lifting for the tourism industry. We know that these businesses like to be really hands-on. The tourism business especially is, you know, wanting to be within the experience, give your travelers what they're looking for. So if you're spending a lot of time, you know, closing out dates, avoiding double bookings, things like that, it leaves a lot of time lost where you could be finding new streams of revenue, just being with the clients, getting those rates and reviews that you want back. And you're not really able to get the full complexity of it, along with, um, you know, booking cutoffs, instant instant reservations, things like that when you're working on a pen and paper, which I know some people still do, which, you know, it's hard to move over to new technologies and kind of get away from what you're comfortable with, um, you're losing out on that instant confirmation and you're also losing out on a whole generation of people that, you know, like that last minute opportunity, they're on their phone, they're in destination. And if you're not giving them that online presence along with making yourself as bookable to the last minute, you're losing out on that type of customer as well. 
Mm. Uh, Alex, uh, Sydney's just mentioned some of the, the, the practical considerations, but some of uh, some of the businesses that will be joining us today will, will never have set up an online booking system previously. Will never will not be au fait with them. So, from your perspective, what are the main practical considerations that would they would need to make in, in terms of moving to online booking and distribution? Perhaps thinking about changes to their their, their business practices, the impact on staff, etc. That's definitely a very, very interesting question. So there is a broad spectrum here that that that, that we're looking uh, at. You know, I I look at it as in two two components: one, the impact on on the guest experience, and two, on revenue, including the operations of of the revenue and the operations of of the business day to day. So every business activity uh, under those two categories would be uh, or should be con considered. So. To list a few, uh, those are the website requirements, the marketing uh, uh, requirements, any financial and, and accounting reporting that they have, their day-to-day -day operations, the staffing that they need, uh, the other technology tools that they're using, inventory management, uh, and all the other revenue sources that, uh, that, that they have. Um, and I would definitely put it is you know kind of at the end of my, my list, but um, it's number I would put it as number one is the guest experience. Um, what is the best experience to provide um, uh, the, the the guest? It's slightly different from one market to to to, to the other, uh, but I would say take the opportunity to speak to your guests and um, <clears throat> feel what they like and don't like and how was your their, their experience and try to factor that in. Mm -hmm. Indeed. T Tyler, I want to come, come to you just now. You mentioned um, in your introduction, you mentioned mom and pop uh, businesses, or some people might refer to them as a one-man band organization or something along those lines. For, for someone like that, what would be the best time, or for any business in fact, what's the best time to inf invest in a, in a booking system in terms of on you know onboarding that um, uh, getting that on, on uh, started up is it best to do that during low season is you know if, if they need to do it before peak season or is there a specific time can you give us your, your thoughts on that yeah so now is of course a great time people are sitting at home and waiting to travel again so the more bookable you can make your business right now the better um, you're setting yourself up so that once borders do reopen and people are free to book activities again then you're giving them that option so definitely now under like more of an unusual circumstance but um typically we see a lot of businesses making that transition usually in the, the first quarter of the year so january february and march as they they get ready for their season um also if you're a winter business again just you know the fall so september october august brilliant what um david what um what would you say are the the key elements that a business should be looking for in a booking system what specifically i know many booking systems out there offer uh, demos or trials what should they look for uh, during such a, a a trial of an online booking system yeah sure so um i guess a couple of things to consider for attractions is first and foremost the ease of use um so being very comfortable with how the system operates that's both internally um, for staff on site, um, visitor services, front of house, how they're going to um, check those bookings uh, at redemption points um, for when the customer arrives. Also consider things like, is the solution cloud-based? Um, does it run off physical servers? Um, how, how easy is it to access across multiple devices? That type of thing. Um, and again, touching on, on Alex's point, making it really um, easy for the customer to go through and book, um, have clear, clear and crystal clear uh, messaging, uh, ticket prices that are very easy to distinguish across different categories. Um, just just asking those right questions of, of how easy it is for that customer to go through and book. And that will then knock into the uh, on-site operations uh, following that, that journey through. Brilliant, thank you. One way which Visit Scotland may be able to provide some assistance is via uh, an interactive checklist, which we've set up. We've set up a specific section on our Industry facing visitscotland.org um, website or industry focused visitscotland.org website. And there's a specific section in there about aimed at helping you 
uh, choose a, an online booking system uh, for, for everyone within the experiences sector. And all of the um, all of the, the companies that we have here today are listed in that section, uh, along and including all the, the relevant contact details, as well as uh, a variety of, of other um, different booking system uh, operators that are uh, um, working in the uh, Scottish market just now. So I'll put the link uh, to that in the chat in due course so that you can all have a look at that, download the checklist, work your way through it, tick what your requirements might be, um, have a look and, and, and then check those off against what the, the various um, companies in the checklist have uh, have got listed as well. And make sure that you're, you're choosing something that's most um, uh, appropriate to you. Um, so we've, we've thought a, a bit about the, the practical elements of the, the the process. Patrick, do you want to take us on to what a booking system can do for businesses in, in terms of the variety of, of choice that might be open via a booking system and maybe specifically some stuff around um, COVID regulations as well? Sure. Um... Yeah, and thanks everyone. Keep those questions coming in. Some brilliant ones. We will get. We'll either touch on them with the questions we ask, or we'll specifically ask these later on. Um, and one of the questions probably touches on what what we're talking about is really about complexity. Uh, and I'm coming to you, Sydney, around this. And it's about sort of a lot of businesses end up with three or four different platforms like um, customer relationship manager uh, management system. They might have a, have a ticketing or booking system they might have um a, 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 sort of might be giving inventory to an, an online travel agent is it better to run these separately what incident what what reason might you change from having these standalones to having an integrated system yeah i mean ideally you want to have everything in one system right it's hard when you're so used to using something another way, it doesn't exactly, like all these reservation systems are built a little bit differently. They're not all gonna be perfect. They're not all gonna fit your business needs, but the idea is to make it as simplified into one area as possible to take away all that heavy lifting from you know you as a system. So I look at it's the redu reduction of overbookings like we discussed before. It's teaching your staff how to use one certain way to make bookings or changes or availability in one area. It's that channel management Aspects. So the more you want sales and to grow, especially during these times, having that in 10 different places is much more difficult than finding new streams of revenue through one aspect. I think CRM is a little bit different based on the reservation system. I know from our aspect, we connect with third parties in that way to provide you a CRM uh, capabilities. It, it's really what you're looking for. And it's also you have to sort of prioritize your non-negotiables as a as a company and what you're willing to learn from these reservation systems because the way you're doing a financial report might be the way you've always done it but maybe one of these systems can actually provide you an easier way if you're willing to you know figure out what it can do for you so it's all about knowledge i think the more you condense it the easier it actually will be it's just a matter of figuring out how things are transferable and you know in terms of the customer facing they're going to be happy no matter what as long as it's easy for them to book and they have a good time on the experience so make sure you're back you know in the back end where all of you guys are putting in the efforts is just not complex as possible Great, thanks for that. So, yeah, that's sort of, in a sense, Alex, a little bit more of, you know, diving into that a little bit better. Specific question here um, about how you integrate your accounting is always important. So, how do you manage the, fi how will the system manage financing? And then also how it integrates in terms of that co consumer facing look, how does it integrate with a website? How easy is that um, in terms of any booking system that you might have? <clears throat> So I'll start with the uh, with with the guest experience and the integration to, to 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 the website. I know from all the technologies out there right right now, the integration to to, to the to the website is has been made very 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 easy. So to, to all the operators out out there, this this should not be a, a worry. It's simply copying and and pasting a code. Now, definitely, there are multiple levels of of integrations and customizations. So. Getting online is is very easy, but then it does take a little bit of of, of investment to uh, make it as personal as possible, to make it fit your brand, um, uh, to give your your guests this a seamless experience with uh, with with your website. Um, uh, it also depends on what type of website. 
um, uh, you're, you're using. But overall, I, I would say that's not a worry or, or con concerns with, with all the booking systems that, that are there and, and that I have seen. Regarding accounting, that's that's more interesting and a little bit more uh, more, more more tricky. Um, there is a lot of revenue codes in accounting that needs a little bit of of, uh, of of mapping. So from from my experience, the initial onboarding is um, is is critical when you are onboarding into a booking system. Is to seeking advice from your auditor or, or accountant onto the revenue codes that are they are using, mapping them to the correct products in in your booking system. It's a little bit of an investment, so I definitely agree with what uh, Tyler said uh, uh, earlier. Use your downtime to do that uh, that that investment. Uh, talk to your accountant, talk to your booking system that that you've chosen to do the correct mapping. And once that mapping is 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 done, it's really an automated API system in the background that's working for you while you focus on your passion, which is serving your guests. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Alex and David. I'm just sort of going to, to sort of continue in, on on that theme in respect of there's a question in here that I've noticed is you know, really how long from start to finish uh, when you've made an agreement with a company say look we're going with you how long does it take if it's a good system and we're assuming everyone here on this on this panel it is a good system uh, how long does it take from start to finish approximately um, to, to, to sort of press go and be bookable um, yes, yeah, so um, I, I think it, it will vary slightly depending on the attraction and the, the inventory they have, of course. Um, you know, if, if the standard ticketing that they're looking to, to set up and go live with, um, as opposed to perhaps uh, annual passes or memberships, online retail, that type of element as well, uh, will dictate that. Um, but certainly in terms of designing the ticket site, having those integrations in place, um, those can be set up fairly quickly. Um, you're looking at probably around the two to four week mark, um, possibly a bit longer, depending on the modules that they wish to wish to add on to that. Um, and that goes as well for any um, onward links to, like we say, EPOS or channel management as well. So um, there is that conversation to have. Um, the last thing you want to do is is over promise that, um, but certainly um, two to four weeks um, plus would be, would be a good indication. Probably a bit of a sort of really intensive look at within that sort of time span. Um, make sure you go through the pain of that, uh, and that then sort of pays dividends and making your life so much easier, sort of for, exactly. for a season. Yeah, exactly. Beyond. And also, it's down to the, to the the booking provider as well to ask those right questions. So it needs to be right for the for the attraction. Um, so obviously, yeah. making sure that, that the ticket prices are correct, the layout is as they want it. Uh, as well, so it is that two-way, two-way conversation. You want to see your prospective booking provider getting to know you, asking questions, not not promising lots, but actually getting to know your business. Absolutely, and, yeah, correct. And, and, yeah, because I mean that's one of the things that comes across most strongly is that the experience sector, um, the products are so varied. There's, there's, there, it's it's quite quite um, extensive that what what businesses might be offering and, and the different types of business models they have and that's Tyler if I could ask you in sort of that um that again that back to this complexity in this at this moment in time there's a lot of businesses who might have you know golf to book uh, have a restaurant a cafe that they might want to book they might have uh, uh bikes to hire and um, and they end up with three four different booking platforms delivering um what, what becomes quite complex because each will have their little oddities. Um, what's, what solutions are there uh, to that out there? Yeah, of course. And this was mentioned before as well with trying to house everything in one system. The less logins you have to deal with, you can handle all your bookings in one place. It's kind of your, your hub of all information. So all your staff can access it. Um, of course, if you're working with you know a golf course, a cafe, again, you want to try to put all that in one place. Um, whether it's segmenting those products on your website. So if people are booking golf, they can easily see golf. If they're looking to book activities, they can book activities. Um, typically in a, a system, what you might find is resource management. So if you do have to keep track of the number of bikes you have in your inventory or the spaces available in a certain part of your venue, um, that's something you could also manage within a system. So yep, just asking those questions and really understanding what is possible within that system to do as much as possible within one system. 
Great, because I think it's fair to say, um, and this has been the biggest barrier for a lot of businesses who've looked at this, say, five, six years ago. It's not about businesses not being prepared to dive into digital. It's been about actually the systems out there haven't been flexible enough uh, to be able to cope with with how um, how businesses work and the, the needs of the customer. Uh, I suppose I'm making a very broad statement here is that the majority of you here at today and, and, and in the wider spectrum of provision, um, you've evolved much, much more because you know that's a need. And therefore, it's in, in the main, with some tweaks, you can you can so you can give those solutions. So just you need to make sure that you're covering those off in your brief or your conversations with with uh, with your uh, solution providers. Is that fair to say? Thank you. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It's it becomes that um, that that close knit relationship, I suppose, with between the attraction and the provider. Um, and the more you understand their their business plan, even if it's starting off with initial ticket sales and then progressing to other modules within the system, um, it's getting that that right from the get go. So, yeah, completely understanding their needs and carrying on that journey with them. Apologies, to everybody. Sorry. So it's Tyler. just a good analogy there for you. It would be uh, it's like cutting a steak with a Swiss Army knife versus a steak knife, right? If you're, you know, the better experience will be with that steak knife versus kind of the all utility knife. So if you do have the steak or maybe if your golf course is St. Andrews, then you're better off using a golf course management system. Um, but if it's a smaller course and it's manageable within your booking system, by all means, it's, it's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, got you. Yeah. That's so a great that. point, uh, that, that, Tyler. I, I'd like to look at it as, you know what's the percent of revenue that that part of the operations is 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 providing and i'd like to look get a specialized system for the source of revenue that gives you the the largest share of of uh, of revenue and the highest margins and integrate the rest into that <clears throat> okay yeah it's an interesting approach one other oh. one other piece andrew yeah if you want to yeah well, please on on that note some somebody did ask a question about the additional extras that can be sold in a um, I think it's probably fair to say that most of you, whilst maybe um, there should be something specialised for, uh, Tyler just mentioned a specific product such as tea off times at St Andrews, but if they're wanting to sell additional extras along the lines of gift vouchers or restaurant vouchers, um, specific maybe a voucher for the, the, the shop or uh, you know any extras, that's all feasible, you know, Sydney that would all be feasible as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I assume most of the reservation systems have the capabilities. Extras are pretty simple to use, whether you want a, a price associated with it, whether it's in the price, um, separate, what part of the checkout process it's in, along with having that gift card functionality, promo codes. Um, you know, we have price modulators that kind of allow you to shift prices during the year for certain sales. So we also encourage it a lot during this time, you know. Um, We've had customers that do a two for one set sort of thing with their tours or, you know, pick an extra, get an extra for free. Because as we get up and running again, the incentive to get people traveling, I mean, it probably won't be hard, to be honest, right? Everyone's itching to get out the door. But at the same time, what puts you, um, you know, above a competitor or above someone else or, you know, what makes a customer want to choose you? And I think everyone's driven by you know, sales and promos, things like that. So whatever you can give them as a freebie is is going to get them out the door. Great. Okay. And Sydney, just you, you touched on, you know, we are in this environment right now um, here in Scotland. Uh, we we're you know the the window of perhaps reopening is is it might be at this point in time might be late April. So um, thinking about COVID specifically. You know, what, one of the th one of the, what's clearly coming across from sort of customers now is that they want to be make sure that they can pay contactless. They want to be very comfortable that they are physically distanced from someone else. Even when we all get vaccinated and that that that, that this um, this is clear. So how how would, does your system how would it help a, a, a provider a tourism business? to to reassure and also make sure that these things um, happen 
Yeah, I think there's a number of ways to do it. Um, you know, first is accepting payment at the time of booking. It's always easy to refund. Uh, we provide actually enhanced refund uh, promotions now where you pay a little bit extra and you're guaranteed that refund through a third party. Um, but knowing that the payments collected beforehand avoids that contact of any payment along with having those time slots maybe you know cool down times in between knowing that they won't cross over having the limited capacity or i know private tours is huge these days so making those private tours with set times set time of how long it is um, and giving them you know the time to leave after that is really important I would say and then you know another thing that I think they want to hear is just the communication so we use a lot of automated messaging whether that's a day after or a day before your reservation you know remind them of this is what we're doing to make sure that we're staying COVID safe uh, if you have any questions contact but we're keeping social distancing we're cleaning XYZ areas um, if you have questions or concerns and then even a feedback after their tour do you think this was did you feel safe and comfortable in this environment and just constantly getting feedback and also it adds to the review sector which we know in this industry is everything so it's all relative um, but these tools and I, I know everyone could speak for for me in saying that we make it so this instant confirmation would allow no crossover and keep everyone safe and separate. Great, great answer. So we, or it's rather Alex, this is this might be I'm, I'm, I'm maybe a bit unfair because I'm, it's quite a specialist question. But um, one individual here is asking, do the, do, would your platform provide? digital disclaimers like medical and consent forms um, that comply with UK GDPR compliances? That's a great question. And so the, the short answer is, is, is yes. The longer answer is that's definitely been um, a focus of, of ours uh, that started about three, three years ago because we do work with a lot of businesses that involve risk. Um, and of course, we, we've created multiple products actually integrated within Checkfront uh, that provide uh, uh, one, those disclaimers, the ability to design them, to uh, bold them. We know that certain uh, certain authorities would uh, like their words to be bolded. Others would like the, some words to be to be put in uh, put in red. So all those options are possible. We've also added uh, an electronic signature component um, um, as, as well to make it even more binding and to facilitate working with insurance companies because some insurance companies require uh, those disclaimers to be to be electronically signed and that the operator has access to a directory of, of, uh, of uh, PDF. Um, and of course, we've taken all the steps uh, to be uh, to be GDR uh, com compliant. And in fact, we do have uh, data warehouses um, in uh, in the EU. So actually, data is is not leaving the EU. Okay, great, excellent, good, good uh, and full uh, response, Andrew. I'm just going to hand back over to you. You can, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about sort of setup and training. Some of the questions around that. I'm Thanks, going to have a look at some of the questions coming in. They're fairly lengthy, so I'm not ignoring you. I'm just having a read of the question. Yeah. Thank you everybody for the, the questions you've sent in so far. I have, if you've not seen it, I have put in the chat um, section of GoToWebinar the two uh, two links that I mentioned, one for Visit Scotland's um, experiences section and also one for the very useful Travel Tech directory which helps you with um, perhaps choosing some other uh, tech companies that are uh, at work in Scotland. David, I want to come to the, the theme of, of setting up a, a booking system and, and perhaps training on it, what kind of um, <coughs> what a business expect in terms of a relationship from the, from a, with a booking system? How often should they expect to have to contact it? We've mentioned a few times, and there's quite a few people on the, this webinar who've, who've posted in comments about being single owner operators or maybe only having a few members of staff. How should that process go in terms of customer support and staff training? and sure. communicate with the, the, the new client? Yeah, of course. So um, I, I think um, a very holistic approach to it um, is key. So um, any client, regardless of size, um, whether that's a, a you know, worldwide attraction, whether it's a one-man band, a family farm park, whatever that is, um, all deserves the same attention, right? So um, whether that's going through the onboarding process step by step, exactly uh, explaining how the processes work from setting up the the inventory 
um, having that available and bookable online, uh, to then redeeming that ticket on site, um, following up further uh, promotional information for future events. That whole journey needs to be fully understood. So, um, I mean, DigiTickets, for, for example, will carry out that whole onboarding process. Um, we carry out training for key staff, key stakeholders. So whether that's the front of house team on site, um, whether that's the back office, finance teams, um, management level, um, each may have their own area of, they, of the business they want to refer to. So it has to be tailored, um, but equally understood um, that they can run the system as they see fit, really. Um, in terms of ongoing, um, uh, we tend to assign an account manager to every client. So there's always that interaction um, and that's that's free of charge. That's part of the, the service. So it's about having that engagement and again, being able to rely on your provider um, to back you up um, when ticket sales are, are good, but also when they're bad as well. So getting the most out of that system. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. On on a similar sort of note, Tyler, if a, somebody's asked the question, if, if a business is setting up a, a booking system and they maybe only have one or two, uh, very few members of staff, who would be the natural fit um, to, to run or to manage that booking system in terms of the usage of it, administration of it, setup of it? Is it, for example, in the case of a single owner operator, would it, would it, should a booking system be accessible on mobile devices so that they, when they're out and about, they'd be able to update their ticket availability or their pricing or anything along those lines? Yeah, of course. So when it comes to the, those cases of the, the one man band or the one person show, right, um, it is good for both people in that situation to to understand the system and understand the components of it. What is great about working with the, a booking system is you're getting essentially a couple extra employees, whether you're utilizing their support, whether you're utilizing the account management, like David had mentioned as well, um, or their onboarding team. And that's something that we offer at Fair Harbor, where you know, when you're getting set up, we actually handle that transition. So um, the dashboard that you're building, something that you actually don't have to deal with if you don't want to. Um, what we also look at is, you know, how are you currently operating and how can you make that more bookable, right? If you are offering time slots every day, every hour, and you find that most people are actually booking at 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., then what you will be suggested is, hey, let's make those the few time slots. It's an easier guest experience and it's easier for you and your team to manage. So that's just something to look out for during that onboarding process of how can you actually not just switch to a booking system, but how can you enhance that? For you and your team as well. Mm -hmm. And on that note, how how often thinking of, of actually coming to manage the, the booking system, how often you know for, for businesses that have never used one before, how often would they need to, to check um to check inventory and pricing? When Sydney think when should they, they, they be updating the system? Should all bookings go through their booking system, even ones that perhaps they take via the telephone? or people that walk up to the if it's a visit attraction or walk up to the tour should everything go through that yeah i think the best way to utilize the system is to have everything go through it also really depends on the complexity of the product if you have you know a flexible start time and free sale with no which probably isn't the case these days but it used to be at one time you know when we had the hop on hop off bus doesn't need as much management because you're kind of free flowing with availability uh, if you have you know a little bit less time slots and complex products, maybe a little bit more private, you want to stay on top of that. Also, like you said, if you are receiving a lot of phone calls in the past or having hoteliers give you a call, that should still all be logged in your system just so you can keep up to date with using the system for what it's for and making sure that all the distribution channels you're closed or you're attached with are getting the closets as well and, and just really having all, all aspects of it connected. Hmm. What, what do we mean by, um, some people won't know, but what do we, Alex, what do we mean by distribution channels? So distribution channels are the uh, various OTAs, uh, and that stands for online travel uh, agencies out, uh, out there that are uh, taking your inventory and reselling it through various channels. I mean, online is definitely the leading channel right, right, right now, so we look at our um, uh, uh, big names in in the in industry such as Serve Advisor, Viator, uh, Reserve with uh, with with Google, so that I just get 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 your guide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sorry if I if I missed any. I'm not trying to uh, make any advertisement here. 
um, uh, and there are also other aspects that uh, that uh, um, uh, that those OTAs have, some of them will have um, offline channels, like they would be operating kiosks on site in certain big destinations. Of course, in the pandemic now, this is not um, uh, this is not as as popular. And then you have um, a direct relationship with with wholesalers and agents. Um, so those are big group two companies that might be buying your inventory in in, in bulk. They would be bringing big inbound tours into into a destination and they would like to book a whole bus on a whale watching trip for for mm -hmm. for example um, uh, so this is this is yet another another channel that operators uh, can uh, can can focus on um, thank you yeah. for that sorry yes and I see a question in here it's 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 probably to to Andrew and I more around um, if Visit Scotland has any stats on um, increased revenue as a result of, of, of taking on a booking system. Uh, we don't, uh, but however, we come across a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence where people are saying uh, they're much more profitable because they're able to spend much more time uh, at, at their storefront as, a, as opposed to sort of being soaked up in administrative duties. And also, there is some evidence, again, anecdotal to say that that because you're able, because we know that, um, and certainly around accommodation, and, and more and more from experiences that people are wanting to book ahead, they're looking for that confirms booking. They want to be able to do that online. And if you don't offer that, then people just move to the next product. They they need that visibility and that reassurance. So uh, there there are lots of good reasons, particularly even particularly more so now. Um, that that needs that desire, and I suppose the other piece is that you know in the past there was a lot of of maybe your customer base who were maybe not used to booking or buying online. If you think about it now, um, my mum buys her groceries online. You know, she's uh, close to ninety years of age. That's that's the changes that this this pandemic has brought across. Those people are very a lot more comfortable. And we'll now switch the same sort of uh, methodologies uh, when 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 things get better for us all. Um, yeah, Patrick. Oh, sorry, I was going to say I have a point on that really quick, just because um, I think this kind of goes hand in hand with having an online system and having those like last minute booking cutoffs. Because I know Boken in 2019, when things were a bit normal, we have a good stat that I like to share with people is that um, we saw a 32% increase in the last minute bookings and a 6% increase in overall bookings just by reducing it to four hours or less. So I think that's really important. Although we're going through a pandemic where you feel like you probably need to have more planned out, still giving them the freedom to have that last minute option is is really everything in this, in this industry. And you'll get a lot more clientele that way and I, I think that's a really good point because one of the, we, we've been do, having these conversations with operators over the last 12 months in terms of trying to understand the sort of changes in, in visitor needs and habits and one thing that came across really strongly when we reopened last July August is that from a, an operator's perspective is that uh, many who are used to bookings um, being made two three months ahead we're working seven days at best, in fact, 24 hours. So the need to be that flexible in order to maximize the number of bookings that you can get is is, is pretty important. Absolutely. I'm going to throw a, a slight spanner in the works there of, of uh, last minute bookings and just ask for the, the panel's opinion, but maybe Tyler, you can go first um, on the, what the, problem or the, the issue that many rural businesses in Scotland face is um, poor internet or poor broadband connection and perhaps uh, those uh, technical issues that they face are make them hesitant or make them nervous about setting up a, an online booking system. What could anything that you can say that can reassure folk around that? Yeah, and that's a totally, totally fair question, right? You want to make sure that you can accept those bookings and, you know, have access to those bookings as well when you need them. Um, you know, first, you know, having an online booking solution shouldn't deter it just because if somebody is booking from their phone at the hotel room or they're booking walking around the city, then they can still book with you. And that can be something to consider in your last minute bookings, right? If you need to have a little bit of notice, then you know, make sure you can accommodate that. 
when it comes to actually managing your booking system, most booking systems will offer a, a mobile application, they'll offer an offline mode, and even the ability to actually print out what we call a manifest so that if for whatever reason you're out on a boat that just cannot have internet access, you still have access to customer information. Um, you know, it could just be their names and contact details, it could be emergency medical information, whatever information that you actually need to have. Um, so yeah, those would be like the two main considerations there. Excellent. Yeah, great for that. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Um, just Sydney, I think just this is a this looks like um, one of our attendees ha has had a nightmare with their with their provider. Um, they it looks like the the provider has suddenly told them that their payment gateway is no longer integrated with their system. And I suppose this individual is saying, look, the question really is, um, does your platform allow there's uh, allow you to use their own payment gateway system or is it always um, your your particular uh, merchandiser? Well, for us specifically, we have 20 to 30 options that you can integrate with. We also have something called Boak and Pay, which is a partnership with Trust My Travel. So we collect the payment for you so you don't have to handle it. And we do payouts accordingly, allowing you to either uh, put the extra fee on the traveler or absorb it yourself. So we give you those two options. There is also a way with custom integration work to have your own payment provider through the widgets, but we feel that the payment providers that we've offered are pretty universal along with giving you the option to let us take care of it for you. Um, there's always a way to kind of get what you're looking for though, if you have the tech resources behind it, but we do think what we've offered, and I'm sure a lot of the systems are the same where we're giving ones that are most recommended and most requested uh, along with the option for us to, to handle payment. So judging by the nodding of the heads as you, when you said that with a little bit of investment um, with development help, it, there's a solution is always possible, but yeah, you, the choice that you give shouldn't shouldn't necessarily lead to that sort of additional cost um, uh, with, with, with the choices you've got. And one other thing that's clearly coming through, very obvious in these times, a lot of our operators haven't been open for over a year. Costs are, are huge. So I'm not going to ask you to sort of um, say how brilliant your own cost system is, but what I would really like you to do is is to explain what is available out in the market. And yes, you can mention how, how your own particular um, business works. Alex, would would that be? Could you could you answer speak to that in terms of those costs that are involved? Sure. So we have a very flexible uh, model in terms of empowering the operator to choose how they would like to uh, to pay. So we offer both the uh, subscription mo um, model, which is our uh, original uh, model, and we also offer uh, fees that the operator can either choose to absorb absorb themselves or pass on to. Uh, to uh, to the guest, um, we don't. Uh, there, normally, there is no. We are we're set up to be a self serve system, and we try to enable onboarding as 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 much as possible. So there are no setup um, uh, fees um, um, involved. Uh, operators could literally get get started for free using our uh, free trial system to get a taste of it uh, before they actually. Um, uh, they actually com uh, com commit. So we would like what what we believe in st strongly is we uh, believe that the operator has the right and should be able to decide how they would like to to uh, pay and invest in their booking technology. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Patrick, I a, there's a question here on which I thought was very pertinent to a discussion about about payments, and it was somebody that asked the question and perhaps. Um, Tyler, if you want to, to have a think about this one, um, somebody asked the question around multiple uh, day tours and payments in multiple parts. What's the best way to deal with them? For example, deposits versus uh, full payments. Yeah, of course. And, and what we typically see in, in tours and activities, we always encourage payment in full in advance. You're getting a, a more committed customer, especially if you are working with a limited inventory. You want to make sure that those guests are, are booking and paying in full, especially if you have the demand for it. When it comes to perhaps a multi-day tour where it's a, a larger ticket price, so there's just you know more involved in the actual process, right? Somebody's probably not booking a multi-day tour at the very last minute. Um, mm. You know that that is a potential option where you know may, maybe you're accepting a partial payment, uh, maybe you're accepting a partial payment 
three months in advance, one month in advance, and then the last payment right before. So mm -hmm. one of those ones where it's a little bit more unique to the operator um, versus kind of what the general public of tours and activities might need. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. David, On somebody's asked a question about maybe a more simple option, but um, somebody's asked, can a, a booking system be used for a normal attraction entry, or perhaps in this case it's a soft play, can a booking system be used for normal entry, but also for um, birthday party inquiries and, and bookings for other elements of the, the uh, whatever the attraction um, offers? Yes, absolutely. So um, a lot of booking systems out there, us included, um, will incorporate general admission, um, whether that's uh, any day entry or particularly time sessions with COVID, uh, very topical. Um, equally, um, sessions for room bookings, uh, I think one of the guys touched on uh, having resources tied to tickets, so whether that's a group booking that requires a specific room in the attraction, um, certain members of staff to be allocated to that party, um, those can all be catered for uh, pretty much as standard across most, most systems. Hmm. And here's a, we were talking about efficiency earlier, here's someone asking a question that's taking it even a, a step farther, and it's around chat bots. So Tyler, um, uh, this is, so this is someone uh, asking if in terms of response to, uh, if, there, if there's a possibility of integrating with uh, any sort of chatbot messaging to answer um, even more things automatically, uh, great bookies, is that something that, that fits within your system? Yeah, it definitely does seem to be more of, more of those like unique aspects of what you might want to have. It necessarily wouldn't integrate in the booking system, but perhaps on your website. Um, we actually build websites as one of our suite of services, and occasionally we do see people integrate a, a chat platform so that if you are getting a lot of inquiries to your website, you can answer those inquiries ASAP. Uh, WhatsApp is another common one that could even be more cost friendly. So um, something that is yeah, it is something that is quite seen. Now, you also might want to go to the core root of the issue. If you do see a lot of people interacting with a chat bot on your website, maybe there's a way that you can make the booking process easier. For instance, maybe the, the book now button is hidden on the home page, or there's 15 different products, but really two are the most popular. So you should really, before going the route of having a chat bot, really make sure that your website, especially the home page, is as conversion and bookable as possible. I think that's a great answer, Tyler. It's one of the things that we sort of major on is that if you um, if you're getting a lot of the same questions, actually there's a, within that there's an opportunity, and that's sort of being able to make sure your website answers those in the future. That your own staff are are are, are, are well briefed and being able to do that, and the likes of your um, Google My Business that you're putting in those questions, seeding those questions, and putting the answers in. So. They're actually there for, for for the public to see, so that they're not having to struggle and and, uh, and find some 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 answers to them. Andrew, um, I think as well, just to sorry, sorry just go to jumping just to jump in real quick. I think also on that, um, uh, we certainly do, and I know a lot of other providers will do the same. Is set up analytics within the ticketing system, um, so from that you can see exactly how people are ordering, what time of day, what device, whether it's mobile or not, um, where those uh, um, bookings might fall off if they abandon checkout, that type of thing. So what that tends to lend itself to is you can then um, tailor your experience a bit more, um, whether it's pushing promotions at certain times of day, um, having um, different inventory displaying at different times of the week, variable pricing. Um, you can use a lot of the back of the analytics side of it. So certainly something to think about as well. Do you know, David, you're getting me a little bit sort of into my geeky thing, and, and apologies to anyone on this uh, on this call. Um, one of the biggest problems our our visitors our, our businesses is that they will put analytics into their website, but as soon as they bolt on a, something like a booking system, they lose sight of that customer journey. So, uh, how do you help businesses keep that um, that that visibility across what effectively is two different um websites the businesses and then yours as the as a booking platform yeah so um assuming they have uh, some analytics there on their website already um i know at digital tickets we will incorporate that within the booking pages so the minute they land within whether it's the ticket in home page or a specific ticket category for an event or a membership or whatever um the the attraction will be able to see exactly what's happened from start to finish so seeing that journey 
go through to checkout and payment, um, or whether it's it's stored at any point uh, and equally where it's coming from, um, what time of day and so on. And I think the bit about that is that all of a sudden you're you're able to see the people who are buying from you, where they're coming from, what uh, what their level of spend is, and how you can sort of adopt and change your marketing so that you can be much smarter uh, at spending your money in the right place so that you get absolutely yeah and then of course you can tailor your, your offering appropriately whether that's going back in offering a discount at a different type of product um, to certain certain areas hmm. uh, there was one other small sort of again smaller question that i'll ask that to you tyler um is there a functionality within your system that we can um, it seems to be about tailoring the, the adults to children um, that are in a party. Is there some way it can can you manage that within your system? Yep. It seems of course, that's great. something that could be. Yeah, so that's something that would be done with resource management. So if you have a you know, adults or children and you want to limit, you know, a child only being able to book when an adult is booked, that's something that can be done. Or it could be a, a family, right? If you have a family, you have two adults and two children. And you need to take out four total spots of an availability or a time slot, then that's possible. I think this was mentioned really early on, but you know, tours and activities are very complex. So having that resource management makes it easy to really accommodate your business. Thank you. A lot of people have asked questions, and I won't um, ask any of you to, to give specifics on this, but a lot of you have asked questions around costs. Um, and would it be fair for if I you can maybe just nod or say yeah that sounds about right but for all of you there are there are a variety of ways uh, that businesses can pay for the booking system for some that might be a monthly or annual fee for others it might be that they can um, uh, incorporate the cost of the booking system onto the ticket price or add an additional fee on is there anything I've missed here that perhaps that I've not mentioned. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think a lot of um, I think that was uh, suppliers out there will have um, different options around that. So whether it's um, a monthly fee, an annual fee, um, a pay-as-you-go model, um, equally th those are quite popular. Some will have set up fees initially, some won't. Um, very often we see, certainly with COVID and the, the admin type um, elements of that with changing bookings and, and session times and things, um, many will uh, include that booking fee as standard now that you touched on. Um, so that's more and more prevalent. So equally that covers an element of that that cost and that outlay. Um, so that's certainly something to consider whether it's a surcharge or a per ticket fee um, as you as you go through with setting up. Okay. Um, Andrew, I think we're we're moving towards the end of the session. Was, was there anything you were just going to ask? Is to... There's one final question perhaps I would have asked and, and I know that all of you don't like losing customers, but from a, a business perspective, how often, and somebody's asked a, a question that relates to this, how often should they be reviewing their decision of, of, of choosing a supplier? Perhaps, Alex, if you could take this one first. And, and what, um, in terms of changing supplier or moving to a new supplier, what learning should businesses take away from, from that process? Uh, somebody specifically has asked a question uh, around um, the site signing up with a platform, putting in a lot of work into it, and then perhaps wanting to change in a year's time. What are any any, any risks to that, or what are the things that they should watch out? People should watch out for. That's a great question. I'm definitely a big advocate uh, of, of of an annual review of of all all your system, but that doesn't mean changing all 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 your systems. I happen to manage a lot of internal systems at Checkfront, for example, and part of my process is reviewing the efficiency of um, of, uh, of of those systems. That's one. Two, reviewing if there are any new features that we already have, we're paying for, and we're not leveraging. Uh, enough or we're not le leveraging at, at all and three if there are any products on the market that we uh, we uh, uh, we should or should not move move to um, data migration is definitely a big big uh, big big cons consideration I that's the question is 100% right in terms of it is a time investment so that is something that uh, every operator should should factor to, to into to the mix that it's not just about the cost uh, paid to the other booking system when you're migrating or to the other system in general, but it's also the time that you're investing in project management and in managing the data and in 
and then resetting um, uh, the, the prices. Now, that shouldn't be something that that to prevent you from, from from migrating, but it just should be one of the factors to think about on this requirements uh, sheet or on your risk reward sheet uh, that you're creating. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it gets us taken just over three o'clock, so I think we're probably out of time for today. Yeah, um, we've a couple of things we want to share with you, just in terms of because we're a, this has been a partnership with Digital Boost. Uh, we'd like to share um, the the additional help and support that's out there from them. They, uh, if if you, if you uh, could go to their businessgateway.com slash digital boost uh, uh, website, you'll be able to understand some of the webinars that are coming up. We've we've got six great sessions in the month of March, which I would like you to look out for. We'll be posting those um, on the Business Gateway site in in the next ten days. Uh, that will help you deep dive into some more of the of some digital support. It's really, really good. And finally, Andrew, we also, um, from a Visit Scotland perspective, uh, I'd like to show you some of the some of the additional information and links that's that's there for you to to uh, share content with us if you wish. Uh, to have some inquiries with our trade team, they'll be able to help. And and ultimately, if you do require any further business advice, uh, use our business.advice visit scotland.com email to ask for any other help.